Hello and welcome to Invertebrate Paleontology and Paleobotany at Utah State University. This is lecture 17 in which we'll attempt to answer the question, what are bryozoans and what has their fossil record revealed about the history of life? This is the first lecture in which we're going to talk about animals with guts. Up to now, the animals that we've talked about in class were composed of only two layers of cells. The endoderm on the inside and the ectoderm on the outside with a central cavity that served both as the mouth and the anus. Yikes. But now, right now, we're going to talk about animals that have guts and that food passes through from a mouth down through it to an anus. This is a really, really important innovation with animals. And we've referred to these animals as triploblastic coelomate animals, since they have three layers of cells and an open cavity called a coelom, which is surrounded by the endoderm cells. Now, there are a few triploblastic acelomate animals, such as platyrrhythmine worms. These are the flat worms. And they, those guys lack a coelom. But they really also lack much of a fossil record, so we're not going to talk much about them in this class. Now, the origin of a gut was likely developed twice in the early evolution of animals. In protostomes, which include many invertebrate groups, including insects, and the group that we're going to talk about today, the bryozoans, the mouth is formed from the blastopore. This is the original opening during ga the gastrulation stage of the early embryo while the anus becomes a separate later opening. This is in contrast to deuterostromes, which um, include us humans, and it also includes echinoderms, the, the starfish. And in us, in starfish, the initial opening develops into the anus, and our mouths are a secondary development in the early embryo, often surrounded by mesoderm cells, um, which later go on to form our brains and other things as well. Now, the gut tube is a pretty important innovation, and it's not surprising that it originated twice. Let's face it. I mean, having an orifice that food goes in and then is digested and then passed out into a separate opening is a really, really, really nifty idea. Digestion can be slow. You can keep the food coming down the tube, which means you can, you can grow faster. All right, so let's talk about the first group of gut invertebrates, the bryozoans, the phylum bryozoa. Now, the first thing you're going to notice about the bryozoa is that they, they superficially look like the cnidarians, like the anthrozoa, the, the corals, the sessile corals that we previously talked about. They are sessile, colonial organisms, and they live in the water. However, if you look closely in the diagram down below, they are also unlike cnidarian coral corals because these bryozoans have digestive guts. They're digestive gurus. One of the important other features of bryozoans is a lophophore. This is a specialized food gathering organ that extends out of a tube or chamber, and it can actively grab particles of food floating in the water, and it brings it down to the mouth. Now, this lophophore is actually a shared trait that's also found in brachiopods, and we'll discuss those guys in lecture 18. Now, the lophophore pulls food into the mouth, which then passes through a narrow gut tube, which then opens up to expel the undigested food and waste, which is actually just peripheral to the lophophore, to the mouth right there. So the gut tube is actually U-shaped like that. Now, U-shaped um, loop. So the anus and the mouth are pretty close together, but they have separate openings. The lophophore also has one big difference when we compare it to the cnidarians, the true corals. It has a muscle that allows the lophophore to re be retracted into the chamber. Now, this is a pretty amazing specialization because this muscle tissue that retracts the lophophore it prevents it from being eaten or damaged when a predator comes swimming nearby or feeding on these things. Now, there's a sphincter muscle also that closes the opening in some of these guys that makes it very difficult for predators to eat these colonial creatures. Now, other types of bryozoans can actually close up these chambers with lids. Now, when bryozoans want to open back up, 
it can release the lofofor by inflating the cecum, which through hydrostatic pressure extends the lofofor again. This is kind of like a balloon, inflating a balloon to open up that lofofor. Now this arrangement of getting hiding away and then coming out means that bryozoans can have sensory cells that will actually trigger that reaction to pull in. You know, light sensing organs or even sensing movement in the water that might indicate a predator nearby. So they have that action to help them survive. Now each pod is called a zooid, and they're attached to each other in very close association. Some bryozoans, like the living smithodes, have specialized zooids, which change with autogeny. And they can also have specialized um, chambers called ovocells. They're used for developing uh, fertilized eggs into larvae. The calcified zooid skeleton is called a zooecum, and these zooecum are what are preserved in the fossil record. Some bryozoans have a hinged door for the opening called a operculum, which, as we'll see with brachiopods, could be related to the two sides of the shelled invertebrates. Bryozoans grow in close association with each other, often connected by structural walls of the zooecum, or like in the case of brown bankeri, a stolum, which is a branching structure somewhat resembling branches on a plant. Growth in bryozoans can be sort of boxy in shape. They can form a fan or feather shapes. They can be encrusting. They can grow on other animals or plants or even hard rocks. They can form really pretty sort of lacy textures as they grow out, um, secreting a calcium uh, carbonate skeleton of calcite. Sometimes in freshwater bryozoans, they form these big gelatinous balls that are found in freshwater uh, rivers and ponds of colonies of bryozoans. Evidence of bryozoans are really common in the fossil record because they can also etch into other shelled organisms, such as this example of a um, snail shale, where you see those little holes, those little pits. Those are formed by encrusting bryozoans. Bryozoans can even encrust on trash that's left in the ocean. This encrusting nature of bryozoan means that we have an excellent fossil record since they readily grow on hard substrates and other organisms, and they leave behind these hard skeletons of calcite. So they fossilize really, really well. As for reproduction, bryozoans can reproduce both asexually and sexually. Asexual budding of zooids grow the colony, while sexual reproduction allows for the establishment of new colonies. Some zooids secrete statoblasts. These are chitin-covered cell masses that can cover these zooids and allow them to survive very harsh conditions, uh, the drying out or cold. Now, most zooids are hermaphroditic, which means they produce both eggs and sperm. The sperm is free swilling and will go about fertilizing eggs located in the oval cells of some bryozoans. Now, these fertilized eggs then produce a larvae, and these larvae can be released into the water with the hope that it'll form a new colony. The parent larvae zooids form what's called the Australia or the first established zooid in a colony. Now, depending on the anatomy of the colony, uh, paleontologists can kind of speculate on which of the zooecum represents the Australia for the entire colony. Let's now look at the classification of various groups of bryozoans. There are three classes, the Phenacolamata, um, which are the freshwater forms, and they have a fossil record that extends back to the Cenozoic. The Steinolamata have a diverse fossil record and were the most numerous during the Paleozoic, with a fossil record extending back to the Ordovician. The final class is the Gymlamata, with a fossil record extending back to the Ordovician and includes both the brown bankeri and smitelli that I've shown earlier. Note that bryozoans don't appear until the Ordovician, despite their primitive nature. The Cnidarians predate bryozoans, but during the Ordovician and into the Permian, bryozoans remain very common in the fossil record. 
Okay, now let's take a look at the various groups of the marine bryozoans, the Stinolamata and the Gymnolamata. The Stinolamata have four extinct groups that all died out at the Permian-Triassic uh, boundary, with one group, the Cyclostomata, that extends up through that boundary up into the Cenozoic. The Gymnolamata includes the Teneostomata, that has a fossil record that goes back to the order of Ischian, and the more common Shelleostomata, uh, which is known mostly since the late Cretaceous and is very diverse today. One of the most common extinct Stelliomata lamata, is the Fenestria fenestella that can be recognized based on its fan-like lacy growths. The Fenestrata also contains some really weird bryozoan fossils. These include the corkscrew Archimedes. The extinct Clyptostomata are branching bryozoans that have broad and fan-like structures. The Treptostomata include common branching or twiggy bryozoans, the Halopora, recognized by the tiny Zoacum. Some members of the Treptostomata form disc-like shapes and they have tiny perforations that extend into the interior of the colony, like stegmatella. The cystopora are similar in being large colonies, often encrusting in irregular shapes. The cyclostomata include the recent mesonella, and are different in that this group has what are called gonozoids. These are large openings for brooding larvae within the ovocell. Now, gonozoids can be distinguished from the more typical smaller openings for the lophophore. So you can see in this picture here, the, these smaller openings are for the lophophore, and these bigger ones with the little perforations in it are for the, the gonozoids that will open up and release those, those larvae. The most common living group of bryozoans are the Shelleostomata within the Gymniolamata and have an extensive fossil record, particularly during the late Cretaceous and Eocene. Most are broad colonies, and these often get mistaken as corals. Bryozoan fossils are particularly common in limestones and form within reef complexes because they're encrusting habitats. They help basically bind together various skeletons, and they add to the increase of calcite in limestones through the secretion of their skeletons. Bryozoans are easily collected, and they can be identified particularly by studying the zoacum underneath a microscope. A simple hand sample can yield uh, thousands of individual zoacum and give a really unique window into the ancient marine ecosystem. They can be identified even with fragmentary remains. I hope that you, too, will seek out some fossil bryozoans. They're a fascinating group of organisms. They make for wonderful fossil collections and are very useful for geologists in inferring past environments. Thank you for watching. Um, if you're interested in taking a geology class at USU, check out the website geology.usu.edu. And if you're interested in who I am, you should check out my website at uh, benjamin slash burger dot o r g. Thank you very much for watching. Take care.